la financiación de las APP, adecuar el riesgo del proyecto a la propensión al riesgo de los inversores. Con este tema hemos llegado a nuestra cuarta sesión plenaria del evento. Nos acompaña como moderador el jefe de división de conectividad, mercados y finanzas del BID, Anderson Caputo. En esta sesión plenaria se, debe, se debatirán las garantías públicas y privadas y otras herramientas y mecanismos de reducción del riesgo para adaptar mejor los proyectos de APP a la propensión del riesgo, al riesgo de los inversores y financiadores, reduciendo así obstáculos a la financiación de las APP en la región. Le damos la bienvenida a la tarima, al moderador y todos los integrantes de este panel. Buenos días uh, a todos. Welcome, welcome to this session, or the plenary session on unlocking financing for PPPs, matching project risk with investors' risk appetite. You know? I, I wanted to just make very, a very br a brief context of what we're going to be discussing as an introduction, and, and then also introduce you to the panel, because we're going to have very different perspectives. We are very lucky with the speakers we have here today. You know? but. As, as, as context, I'm going to start with something we all know. No? We know that there are barriers preventing emerging markets and developing economies from attracting substantial global savings that could be directed toward infrastructure projects. No? There are several studies. There is also the practice of every day that we, we know several of these barriers, what they are. No? That includes information asymmetries, like lack of predictable and significant pipelines. Sometimes we always say like it's a matter of pipelines, it's not, it's not the capital, no? Having the bankable projects, right? Uh, lack of credit, credit worthiness and political and regula regulatory uncertainty, no? Additionally, additionally, there is also a limited supply of financial instruments that can ally projects' risk return profiles, and that will be a key topic that we have here how to align risk return profiles, making them attractive then to the private investors to come. No? However, there are ver various useful instruments that can help bridge the gap between perceived risk and actual risk, and we are going to be discussing some of them, getting the experience of those of which ones are more effective. And then what is also important in the context of this meeting here, where we have multilateral banks and we have several public development banks, now, is really to, to know that we have a significant role no, uh, by offering financial instruments and financing schemes to enhance the viability of these projects and let the capital flow. No? Uh, it's, uh, it's all like in this context that I'm just telling that uh, it's essential to encourage then the dialogue like that we here is an example among stakeholders in strengthen the coordination between public and private sectors for financial solutions to be effective. No? In this session, then, we are going to be exploring exactly that, no? the challenges uh, to mobilize private capital, uh, especially looking at the social angle and PPPs, no? and, and, and like what could, we could be, what could be done, what's more effective, what are the problems. And then, as I mentioned, we have a brilliant panel here, no? and starting uh, here with Elizabeth Hoberet, uh, sorry for the, my pronunciation, uh, is the chief of the infrastructure and energy division at IDB Invest. She has a structure and participated in financing infrastructure projects in the private sector, including long-term and subordinated loans, bridget loans, local currency products and guarantees for energy projects in Latin America and the Caribbean. No? Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for joining us. No? Gaela Gering Flores, which uh, we are just speaking, we come from the same university, <laughs> we had experiences before, is a partner from Allen Overy, a leading provider of legal advice on infrastructure, and specifically PPP-related infrastructure matters. Gaela draws on decades of focused experience representing both multinational cooperation and sovereign states in international commercial and investment arbitrations. Now, so Gaela is, 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 is is that person that is there to help avoid you getting into trouble. <laughs> and then if you get into trouble, 
like a, what is the most efficient way of getting away of it, no? So, so she, she's a Juris Doctor from Georgetown University Law Center and has a bachelor degrees in political science from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Thank you very much uh, for participating in the panel. And then uh, Ismael Villanueva Zuniga, no? uh, currently head of emissions and international relations unit at NAFIN, the National Nacional Financiera de México. Ismael Villanueva has an impressive CV as well, a PhD in administrative sciences from Institute of, uh, of University Studies, has two master's degrees, one in business administration from the Latin American University and another in administration from the University of Texas, and has a degree in accounting from the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Thank you very much, Ismael, for participating in this panel. So you see that I was not lying. It's an impressive panel uh, we have here with very different perspectives. No? And we will engage in a dialogue about overcoming the financial obsta obstacles for PPPs, which is essential to ensure the success of any project that we, we are talking here about PPPs and several projects. Through this panel, we aim to understand how project risks can be aligned with investors' risk appetite to maximize their impact. So I'm going to start with Elizabeth. No? Uh, in the context of the infrastructure challenges in Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, could you elaborate what you consider to be the most effective financial incentives for driving the development of PPPs in infrastructure and social projects? Over to you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you, Anderson. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, well. I, this is a good question. I, I think we've seen a variety of, of, in, of incentives used in successfully. I, the way I see it, there, there's sort of this, this you know, spectrum that exists between fully privately developed and constructed and operated projects and fully publicly developed and operated projects on the other side. And, and every project falls somewhere on the spectrum as far as I'm concerned. And, and there's this exercise that takes place, and sometimes explicitly, sometimes implicitly, of you know, allocating risks and costs for each project between the public sector and the private sector. And that's, that's something that takes place as, as projects are developed. And, and, and really, the outcome of that exercise is what's determining where the projects fall on that spectrum. And so there are projects that would require less public participation, PPP projects that require less public participation. And, 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 and by the way, financial incentives is one way that there are incentives, but there are also regulatory incentives and fiscal incentives and things like that, that other, other incentives that are out there that are very, very important in terms of uh, you know, approvals of, of permitting and land rights and things like that that can provide a lot of important incentives. Um, but, but an example like the energy sector that we've seen in the region, you have a number of um, you know, public auctions that have taken place recently where, that have been very successful in the region, where it's the regulator that's organizing an auction and, and the outcome is whoever wins the auction gets a, PPP, a PPA, a power purchase agreement. And, and just the power purchase agreement makes the project bankable right away. You know, that, that's an incredibly powerful way to make the project bankable for pr private banks, for private investors. You know, and, and it's not a really a, a, a financial incentive, but it's a very important way that we can make those projects bankable. And in most cases, you know, the, the PPA off-taker is bankable, and, and that makes sense without any other, you know, support from the government. And in some cases, the government provides other kinds of support for the PPA off-taker. For example, the Renovar project, uh, program in Argentina, where there's sort of a liquidity backstop facility that the government provided as well to, to, you know, to, off, to mitigate, mitigate the risk of the off-taker. So that's you know, different types of support that you can see. You know, these types of public auctions, it's very important. Broad participation is important. So sometimes there's often, um, uh, an, uh, you know, they, they'll put in um, linking the, the price of the offtake to U.S. dollars. And that's an actually a financial incentive. I mean, it, it, it creates a, a, a facility where, you know, as, as 
as exchange rates change, the prices could change. And so, but that makes a difference. It gives you a broader group of investors and a broader group of banks that can participate in these projects. And so therefore is a financial incentive. So th these sort of things are commonly used in the energy sector and have been quite successful. Pushing a little further along the spectrum to like transport projects, for example, you have using you know, the, the 4G program in Colombia as an example, you have seen a lot of success there with projects that have a combination of income you know, coming from, they're, you know, they're awarded a concession, the project, project developers, and the income from the project is coming from a combination of uh, you know, payments from the government as well as toll, road, toll traffic, you know, traffic revenues. And as we've seen with, in Colombia, as the, as the program has matured, the percentage, the weight of the government payment has reduced and the weight of the toll revenues has increased. And that makes a lot of sense, you know, given the, given the maturity of the program and the success that's, that's been happening, happening. So you have some where you have a little more, there's a little more public support in those cases. And then you get into more, you know, kind of complex and riskier projects probably bigger infrastructure, bigger um, toll road projects or bigger transport projects or as well as health and education could fall into a category where you do need sort of explicit availability payments in many cases to make projects bankable and to make private investors interested in those projects. And, and those payments are typically relatively fixed payments indexed to inflation in most cases and they can you know, have a very uh, positive impact. There can also be going one step further, especially for projects with long uh, construction periods, subsidies from the government, payments from the government, actual you know, grants that can be made upon the completion of certain construction milestones. And that's another financial incentive. You know, it's much more costly than the PPAs that we talked about with the energy sector, but it has an impact um, and it has been shown to be very successful in the region. So it depends on the sector, it depends on the country. A lot of different instruments can be used um, and, and we've seen them used successfully in the region. No, thank, thank, thank you so much, Elizabeth. So, so we get to this point of, uh, there is really like a broad toolkit that you need to adapt to, to, to the different sectors, or even sometimes the, the different contexts in each country, and then on top of it also not consider only the financial incentives, but also there is a whole range of regulatory things that could be done, exactly. right? Now, excellent point. Now I want to draw from, from the, the very rich experience you have, Gaela, on, on, on seeing the problems on the ground, no? because we know that theory and in practice can diverge quite a lot when you go down the, the road of having these projects. No? And you have, a lot, you have seen like firsthand and worked for several years no? uh, uh, in seeing those struggles. Like, could you then bring a bit of this richness of your experience and discuss the areas of risk appetite or expectations that they sometimes have, but that most often lead to problems down the road for, for the ultimate success of a project? Over to you, and we're so glad to have, have you here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anderson, and thanks to everyone here in the IDB. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, and I guess, you know, let's just talk about the elephant in the room. When I start speaking in spaces like this, people tend to say, oh my gosh, she's just going to talk about all the bad things. She's going to talk about what happens when things go wrong when people sue each other. She's talking about disputes. This is not fun. Um, okay, yes, things go wrong. This is true. And I do step in a lot when things go wrong in projects, when people get in fights, when people get into, into disputes. But I guess one thing that I'm here to say is that that's not inevitable. Many disputes are absolutely preventable. And there is a common theme in a lot of investment disputes, in a lot of disputes involving PPP projects, and that is risk. And I guess what I would encourage everyone in this room to do is to really take a good look at the investment dispute decisions that exist. There are many. And educate yourself on 
what are the types of risk assumptions and expectations that investors made going into a project that tended to lead to a dispute later? And maybe those risk assumptions led to not a great result for the investor in the dispute. Those sorts of disputes, those sorts of ex assumptions and expectations are correctable and preventable. And so what I've seen, generally speaking, the types of, the types of risks, risk assumptions that have led to the biggest amount of preventable disputes, if I can be a reductionist for a moment, is an assumption around the idea of zero risk. And we know zero risk doesn't exist in real life. You can't have an investment without risk. Okay, so what's the other assumption there? The other assumption there is that, that I see a lot, is that the state should take on all of the risk or certain risks that the way international investment law today exists would never be deemed legitimate by an international tribunal. So, uh, what, am I, what am I talking about? What sorts of risks might an investor think are okay to place on the state or fully on the state but that actually might lead to a dispute and it might actually lead to the investor losing that dispute. The type of risks I'm talking about here are usually ESG related risks. And I'm sure everybody's heard the term ESG these days. And as a general matter in these investment disputes, ESG kind of boils down to regulatory changes or issues or events circling around environmental protections, labor protections, public health protections. So, um, those are the sorts of risks that when you're starting to enter into a PPP project, and as an investor, I absolutely understand you're trying to reduce your risks, but you need to keep, out, keep an eye out for maybe a tendency or a desire to allocate all of those risks to the state. Um, and, I'll, and I'll save why for, <laughs> for a little bit later in the panel. Um, because those sorts of assumptions can lead investors into trouble, into troubled waters. And uh, they might not be the insurance policy maybe that you think it is. Uh, so I will, I will leave it there. So that's, that's the area of risk assumption and risk allocation that I feel um, might lead to more trouble um, going forward and might lead to a dispute actually happening as opposed to being prevented. I, I, I hope that uh, you can all hear me. No, I, I think there are two things super important here for, for us all, no? I think that the way you started saying that, uh, uh, yes, you're there to solve trouble, but this can be preventable. I think it's a very striking message, but the other one that gets a, a, a bit of, I think, tension in the room for everybody is, is when you mentioned that uh, a lot of this is related to ESG, and we know that for attracting private capital today, ESG is essential, no? So, so, so it's, very, it, it's a very interesting connection there. Uh, and thank you very much for highlighting those points. Let us go to Ismail that has like firsthand, like it's in the front line you know, uh, uh, perception that Ismail, I have a, a very easy question to you, no? which is asking you for the key recommendations. <laughs> so, so what would be your key recommendations to align project risk with the investor risk appetite that we're discussing? especially that in the volatile, complex context of finance in Latin America and the Caribbean. Over to you, Ismael, with the easy question. Thank you, <laughs> you Anderson. Thank you, thank you. 
it's a pleasure for me <laughs> to be here. And thank you for the IDB for the invitation. Uh, to the benefit for the audience, I would like to answer in Spanish. In Nacional Financiera y, Nacio y el Banco Nacional de Comercio Exterior son dos bancos en México de desarrollo, bancos de desarrollo mexicanos. Estos dos bancos dependen de la Secretaría de Hacienda y Crédito Público, nuestro eh, Ministerio de Finanzas en, en nuestro país. Eh, actualmente eh, se realizaron diferentes actividades en estos dos bancos de desarrollo eh, con la finalidad precisamente de identificar estos riesgos y su participación en, en el mercado de las asociaciones público-privadas. Eh, concretamente, eh, Nacional Financiera lo que realizó fue una identificación primero del de, eh, posicionamiento de sus eh, rentabilidades. Eh, normalmente, Nacional Financiera tenía dos tipos de rentabilidades, la mínima y la objetivo. Precisamente para alinear esos riesgos del inversionista versus los riesgos del proyecto, lo que primero se hizo fue eh, generar una tercera rentabilidad para ubicarla en un concepto de recuperación y de conformidad con las prioridades del gobierno mexicano, eh, identificar en dónde poder invertir. Eh, hace muchos años ya México ha participado en el concepto de APPs a través de, las, de los conceptos de carreteras, por ejemplo, en donde se ha invertido una gran participación de, 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 del gobierno, del sector público en esta, en esta actividad. Eh, creo eh, que uno de los principales eh, factores que puede beneficiar en el concepto de la toma de riesgos al inversionista es la participación de un banco de desarrollo en este tipo de proyectos. Es decir, el que esté financiando un banco de desarrollo este tipo de proyectos hace que exista certidumbre del gobierno mexicano en el proyecto por el número o la cantidad de años a largo plazo de este tipo de, de iniciativas y también le da certeza al inversionista de que el banco o en este caso el gobierno al estar implícito e inmerso en, esta, en este proyecto eh, los flujos de efectivo, los flujos de recursos prácticamente se pueden garantizar a lo largo de todo el proyecto. Entonces, digamos, son, son dos de las actividades principales. Una, la actividad de estar analizando el proyecto desde la banca de desarrollo, la participación del banco de desarrollo en el proyecto y hay otra serie de elementos que también realizamos en Nacional Financiera que es el concepto de garantías y el concepto de contragarantías, que prácticamente con recursos de capital del banco, es decir, no son recursos subsidiados por el, por, por, de manera específica por el sector público, sino con recursos de capital del, del propio banco, apoya con garantías y con contragarantías a proyectos específicos que pudieran también derivar en, una, en un menor riesgo y eso hacer que evidentemente la rentabilidad de recuperación se vuelva atractiva porque ya no hay un costo financiero directo al, al inversionista. Entendemos que el inversionista pues principalmente su objetivo está basado en la rentabilidad del proyecto y, y, y el gobierno con esto hace que esa rentabilidad, digamos, se adecue a las necesidades del inversionista, el banco pueda también tener una recuperación de sus costos y evidentemente el inversionista a través de claramente un programa de trabajo con un cronograma, con actividades y con plazos diversos eh, a largo plazo y con flujos de efectivo fijos y seguros, puede evidentemente estar eh, garantizando junto con el gobierno este tipo de, de actividades. Principalmente lo que hoy en Nacional Financiera tiene como estrategias es sí participar, digamos, en diferentes proyectos prioritarios que identifica el gobierno federal, pero también, digamos, incentivar la creación de proveeduría en, en diferentes eh, actividades a través de las micro, pequeñas y medianas empresas y también participar en, eh, digamos, la generación de mercados eh, con la incorporación de la inclusión financiera en este tipo de, de empresas. Entonces, estas tres estrategias de nacional financiera vinculadas con el concepto de, de APPs y con la modificación de eh, la rentabilidad de objetivo a mínima y de mínima a de recuperación, creemos que el inversionista se puede sentir muy cómodo en la participación. Claro, el gobierno mexicano siempre ha buscado que este tipo de participaciones traigan un beneficio directo a la, a la comunidad, a la sociedad, eh, eh, generando 
evidentemente bienestar, ya sea en un concepto de inclusión financiera o de infraestructura para este tipo de, de comunidades en, en nuestro país. Eh, eh, por ahí me iría en la, en la respuesta. No, no, no muchísimas gracias. As, 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 then it, it's, it's, there is really a holistic type of areas that you, you can then be, be entering, you know, from, from the preparation of the projects to, to the de-risking, etc. But that's a very good segue to then to the second round of discussions that we are going to do. And I'm, I'm going to return to, to Elizabeth exactly now, going from, from the perspective of multilateral development banks, you know, and then tying really well you know, to what we just heard. Uh, how multilateral development banks then from, from that angle can effectively help close these financing gaps you know, for public private partnerships in budget max and development economies. What, what, what is, it, is there in the toolkit and then that could be complementing the role of public development banks as well? Sure, no, I, I think um, one of the things that we can do, I mean an IDB group is a good example of this is bring people together, make these connections. We have our public sector side and our private sector side that work very closely together and that we have the ability to, you know, see and the private sector, you know, a demand for something in a regulatory failure and then on the public sector side actually work with the government to try to resolve that. So I, that's I think an important role just that 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 bringing and this this is a, this conference is an example of being, how we're able to bring entities together, you know, from the public and the private sectors to help resolve these issues and talk about these challenges. So that that's certainly important just that positioning, but I also think that one of the main roles that we have, and it also, I think, keys off of a lot of what Gaelo was saying, is reducing uncertainty, you know, because investors don't like uncertainty. We certainly can't close the financing gap on our own balance sheet. We just don't have that. You know, it's massive amounts here. So you have to be able to mobilize private investment. And, and they, there's not a real affinity for uncertainty. In, in, and, and so I, we do that, I think, by helping to create the you know, predictable regulatory environments, stable regulatory environments that investors can feel comfortable with, we, which is largely done on our, our, our public sector side and, and by Gaston and his team, the creation of these, this upstream work and the projects that are being developed with governments to try to put in place these frameworks and create these, uh, create these projects that, that investors will find um, appealing. In addition, I think that talking about the ESG risks and everything, you know, we have a real role in terms of the standards that we set in these markets for the development of these projects. We have, uh, you know, a lot of the time our clients are a little overwhelmed sometimes working with us because we do have a lot of requirements. We do have very high standards. We're looking very deeply at projects in their environmental and social impact, their governance, you know, corporate governance, we're looking at legal impact, everything related to the project. And when there are gaps between our requirements and what the project has, you know, the project's characteristics, we help fill those gaps. We have, help bring the projects up to higher standards. And, and since these risks, you know, these non-financial risks can become financial risks very quickly, we're reducing the uncertainty of the project just by, by in, in, you know, um, using the high standards that we have. And you know, so very important as well that, that we're doing that. And, and then I think we also you know, can channel more, as we've talked about, of uh, the concessionary resources, blended finance resources that help to take risk. I mean, we explicitly take risk with our own balance sheet by offering longer tenors, by offering subordinated debt equity, by looking at you know, new technologies and, and things like that. But there are really pushing the boundaries we, we were able to use the blended finance for that. And, and so I, I just think building that capacity and our risk appetite as well is important in terms of our ability to help bridge that gap. I'm glad, I'm glad, I'm glad you mentioned about uh, uh, blended finance because this is a topic I'll, I'll, I'll come back with this is my own talk about uh, that. Uh, uh, and also I, I'm very glad that you mentioned the ESG standards no, as, as a role that MDBs can help because that goes directly to the point we discussed before with Gaela. And, and, and 
And back to you, Gael, is, is I wanted to, to, to ask a, a question on one point, no? and especially for the government officials that are here, like uh, we are, that are all the time asked to reduce risk, reduce risk, reduce risk, right? Like there is always this demand of how, how much risk would be transferred to the public sector. So the question is, is this, in this context of investment in projects, it's argued that the public sector should play this catalytic role by partially, and then of course, many times they're asking for totally <laughs> assuming the, the, the different types of risks that discourage the private investors, retaining then the minimum risks necessary to attract private financing and at the same time maintain the financial viability of projects. No? So, so what's your view on that? Like what are the main benefits and challenges of promoting private investments in projects that are of public, public interest? Over to you, Gail. Thank you, Anderson. So continuing on my last theme uh, with respect to risk, risk allocation and what is a preventable problem, what's a preventable dispute, uh, I have seen in many investment disputes an investor uh, taking the position that the state should have assumed completely a particular sort of ESG-related risk. One that comes up a lot is social unrest. Social unrest comes up a lot. And investors many times have been before investment tribunals saying that that should have been a risk that the state assumed, that the state should have done something about that and, and they didn't do whatever I thought they should have done. And it was my legitimate expectation that the state take on that risk. Um, that's one form of this risk assumption or this one form that this risk assumption manifests. Um, another way in which this risk assumption I've seen manifest is the investor goes into the project expecting the state to freeze its environmental regulatory regime. That's another problematic area of risk allocation and risk assumption. And I'll, I'll tell you why in just a second. Um, and, or even uh, the investor expects or assumes that the state will absolutely guarantee the result of the permitting process when they haven't gone through the permitting process yet, um, which would essentially involve going around the environmental regulatory regime. That's another type of risk allocation or risk assumption that, that will generally lead to big problems um, in investment disputes. Problems for the investor. Why? Because it may be that about 20 or 30 years ago, these sorts of risk allocations were acceptable in international investment law and the international investment regime that we have. But that is no longer the case. There are now a great number of investment treaties that specify, and if you want, you can refer to the trade promotion agreement between the US and Panama that have specific clauses that say specifically that the state may not derogate from its environmental or public welfare regulatory regime in order to attract investment. It says that. Also, there is a growing amount of jurisprudence in the world on the concept of ESG issues. And I would encourage everyone to look up the Shell decision that came out of the Netherlands court a few years ago. Also, the ESG supply chain due diligence law that the European Parliament just approved on June 1st, just last month. These decisions, those provisions of investment treaties, that law that the European Parliament just approved, 
is a new wave or a newish wave of thinking about allocation of risk and responsibility with respect to ESG principles and concepts. Therefore, if an investor goes into a project and, you know, let's say, asks the state or the public sector to completely freeze the environmental regulatory regime as a hypothetical, and let's say something goes wrong, and let's say that goes to a dispute, and the investor goes before the International Investment Tribunal and says, no, no, but, but the state was supposed to freeze the environmental regulatory regime for me, for my project. Do you know what the Investment Tribunal is going to say? They're going to say, no, 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 no. We reject that argument. That is not a legitimate argument. That is not a legitimate expectation. Uh, so that's, that's what I think is important for people, you know, for investors, for the investment to community to understand, particularly in the ESG realm, um, and particularly in PPP projects. There are a number of risks that can be carefully allocated over to the state and negotiated over to the state. But I think people need to be very aware of the fact that there are certain risks that now, um, if, if you want to prevent uh, a dispute, there are certain risks that cannot be allocated to the state. Gaela, thank, thank you so much for being so specific and providing an example. And, and again, coming back to ESG as in the center. No? And, and I, I totally see this point that ESG, as we all, we all know also, like it's such a dynamic topic, no? That uh, you gave the example, no, of new regulations just coming up and the risks of trying to freeze that, no? Um, and so, so, so it's a, another topic that, uh, like, it, ESG comes uh, back over and over again and, and it's such a trend, no? As all the, like, financial systems trying to, to be, like, a, the, the main thing that regulators are trying, green in the financial systems, investors going in that direction, no? Such a dynamic. Let me go back to Ismael, and, and as I, I had mentioned, uh, there is this issue of uh, uh, the coordination of stack, stakeholders from the public and private sector that we know that this is necessary for de risking you know, and, and blended finance solutions to be effective. So, how do you believe, Ismael, that uh, coordination and value creation focus between public and private sectors can be improved? to ensure the success of the risk and blended finance solutions and the achievement of the sustainable development goals. Thank, thank you uh, for your question, Anderson. Um, bueno, esto lo, lo, lo podemos platicar desde el punto de vista de, de Nacional Financiera y de Banco Mext. En, en estos dos bancos de desarrollo lo que, lo que hoy han realizado primero es eh, una identificación clara de los productos que tienen eh, hoy en día en su catálogo de productos y servicios financieros. Esos productos financieros eh, los alineamos eh, primero a los ODS. Y cada uno de esos productos financieros alineados a los ODS han identificado una serie de oportunidades en los bancos. Eh, establecimos como tal una estrategia eh, de sostenible que nos ha llevado precisamente a identificar algunas métricas y algunos indicadores que pudieran ser beneficiosos o, o benéficos para eh, las micro pequeñas empresas o por aquellas empresas que están eh, vinculadas con el comercio exterior. Eh, primero lo que podría eh, señalar es eh, este concepto de rentabilidad, eh, de recuperación, está vinculada sí con uno de los proyectos y, y programas prioritarios del gobierno federal en donde solamente y de conformidad con el interés que tenga en el proyecto y en la comunidad, poder vincular esa rentabilidad de recuperación. Y esa rentabilidad de recuperación se va a obtener siempre y cuando se obtengan eh, o se, o, o se genere de lo, del capital del banco, es decir, sin subsidio y con un concepto de recursos a bajo costo. ¿Y cómo obtenemos estos recursos a bajo costo? Eh, estos recursos a bajo costo, una de las alternativas que hemos identificado es generar emisiones de bonos temáticos sociales y ambientales o sustentables. 
y esto sí nos ha permitido en Nacional Financiera y en Banco Mex obtener recursos a esos bajos costos que pudiéramos trasladar al beneficiario final, en este caso la empresa que realiza comercio exterior o la empresa micro, pequeña y, empresa, eh, micro, y, micro y pequeña que está fortaleciendo la proveeduría de esas grandes empresas. Eh, eh, a través de este concepto de, de estrategia sostenible, hemos vinculado ya la emisión de bonos temáticos con cada una de las métricas e indicadores específicos de los productos y servicios financieros que genera el banco con el cliente final, que es cómo hacemos también que ese cliente final se sume a la cadena sostenible para que él participe efectivamente en cada una de estas grandes empresas y en esas cadenas de valor. Vinculo también este concepto de la respuesta porque ahí identificamos que estos financiamientos pudieran ser a bajos precios, a bajos costos y como tal eh, el, la empresa también pudiera ser beneficiada porque hoy en día esta tercera estrategia que tenemos en el banco, les hablé primero de la inclusión financiera, les hablé en, en segundo lugar de los proyectos y programas prioritarios del gobierno federal, pero este concepto de la tercera estrategia que tienen los bancos es precisamente apoyar a través del Tratado de Comercio México, Estados Unidos y Canadá, al que tenemos acceso nosotros en, en nuestro país, poder llegar a ese mercado en Estados Unidos que es el mayor eh, comprador o importador de productos y servicios ¿Cómo hacemos o cómo llegamos a ese mercado, eh, digamos, de Estados Unidos? Es a través de ese tratado de libre comercio y en el concepto de la relocalización de empresas. Entonces, este otro eh, tema que, que traemos como una estrategia en los bancos hace precisamente que al abrir las oportunidades o al abrir el mercado a estas empresas que quieran relocalizarse en nuestro país, hay una serie de beneficios y de ventajas que también podemos ofrecer desde el Banco de Desarrollo. Originalmente decíamos, la participación del proyecto APP eh, da certeza si es que el Banco de Desarrollo está ahí. También, si el Banco de Desarrollo está presente en un concepto de sindicato de bancos, es decir, participo con los bancos comerciales, yo como Banco de Desarrollo, también en estos proyectos de financiamiento importantes del gobierno federal a través de la relocalización de empresas y jalo a toda la proveeduría, va, voy a tener una mayor dinamismo, una mayor economía y eso automáticamente nos va a eh, beneficiar en tener costos a mejores y a, y a más baratos precios. ¿no? Entonces, eh, ahí está digamos, el posicionamiento de, de, del Banco de Desarrollo Mexicano tratando de beneficiar con la vinculación de los ODS, con la vinculación de estrategias sostenibles, con la vinculación digamos, de métricas y de indicadores específicos que beneficien el concepto de ASG en esta, en esta dinámica. Y más aún, en este estudio que hicimos del New York Shoring a través de la relocalización de empresas, hemos identificado que hay una serie de productos concretamente hay 40 productos y servicios que está demandando el mercado norteamericano en 17 sectores, en donde si analizamos en América Latina, eh, digamos, y el Caribe, cuál es la participación que tienen todos nos, nuestros países en ese mercado, prácticamente asciende solamente al 20% de las actividades y productos y servicios que está demandando Estados Unidos. Es decir, hay una posible, una, una oportunidad manifiesta de poder incrementar el número de participación que tenemos en ese mercado eh, de Estados Unidos. ¿Y cómo vamos a hacer esa participación o ese incremento de productividad o ese inc incremento de capacidad eh, instalada o incluso de explorar nuevos sectores o nuevos productos, pues a través de este acceso a financiamiento que los bancos de desarrollo están realizando, ¿con qué? Con el beneficio de los bonos temáticos a través de esta obtención de mejores eh, recursos a mejores precios. Entonces, ahí identificamos prácticamente esta cadena. Claramente vemos una oportunidad para toda América Latina y el Caribe de poderse subir a esta alineación en el concepto de la relocalización para aumentar nuestras capacidades y el Banco de Desarrollo, en este caso mexicano, o los bancos de desarrollo a nivel de Latinoamérica, podían claramente identificar estos niveles de oportunidad que a su vez le permitan a esa empresa subirse a esa cadena de, de valor de suministros eh, en todos los eh, productos y servicios que en este ejemplo les quise, les quise mostrar. Eh, por ahí eh, eh, el Banco eh, Nacional de Comercio Exterior eh, ha, ha caminado, eh, por ahí camina Nacional Financiera a nivel, eh, digamos, de nuestro país, con la finalidad precisamente de identificar todas estas actividades en beneficio de la, de la micro y pequeña eh, mediana empresa y evidentemente de la participación 
del inversionista en el concepto de las asociaciones público-privadas. Eh, concretamente, eh, digamos ya para terminar la, la respuesta, eh, en nuestro país identificamos en el inversionista una estructuración, de tari una estru una, eh, una estructuración tarifaria de estos programas en el concepto de APP. Lo que nos permite es identificar eh, en una primer tarifa el, el frente hacia el financiador del Banco de Desarrollo. Después, en una segunda tarifa, ya vienen los costos directos asociados al inversionista en una APP. Y en una tercera o cuarta tarifa, ya identifica los gastos fijos o los gastos variables. Y eso puede darle certeza al inversionista de que el Banco de Desarrollo está en el proyecto, que tiene una, un feed prácticamente garantizado y en una tarifa independiente. Después, ¿cuál es la tarifa que tiene él identificada a nivel de sus costos fijos? Y después, ¿cuál es la tarifa que tiene identificada a sus costos variables? La suma, evidentemente, de estas tres, de estas tres o de estas diferentes tarifas hace que tenga él claridad desde el día 1 o desde el año 1 hasta el año 20, normalmente, de cómo va haciendo su programación en el tiempo y en el plazo. Es un poco ahí la respuesta. Eh, gracias, Anderson. Matt, thank you very much for, for, for a very holistic view. And then one thing that I thought that is very important that connects uh, all, all here, uh, and it's a trend, because you also like link into the sustainable development goals. You also link into the ESG discussion that we are having here. And then what I, th I think that is extremely important that you mentioned is this part that we started talking about the indicators to measure, like, and then in a strategy that is focused on impact and having a credible measure for that, because I think that in the end, in this discussion, what is uniting everything from the regulatory risk and, the, and then the disputes and et cetera is like, how can we measure well? How can we, we show that we are uh, like uh, having impact and, and putting really the, 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 the funding, the financing in things that are aligned with the uh, sustainable development goals, ESG more generally, you know, and sustainability more generally. So, so, that, so, so, so there is no question for all of us that investors, like a bit from, from institutional investors or banking side, they are aligning their focus to, 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 to look for, for investments that would have this, this type of impact. And, and then I see, like in the points that were raised by the three speakers from different perspectives, be it the multilateral agencies like helping no? in framing what really SG could be, what are the frameworks. No? like the, the, the public development banks putting that in practice, like what is the impact, and then having this series of products that you have, you mentioned, that go to sustainability, like to sustainable development goals. So there is a whole shift in mentality in financial sector and how funds are being mobilized, no? that there is a very different narrative that we have now and we need to embrace that. The world is changing and it's very dynamic. There is no way to freeze things as was a point on the legal side, no? So I, 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 wanted, like, I, I wanted to leave that as a message here that I think that a, a key part that discuss, of the discussion that led to us here that we're talking about aligning risks, right, for the investors, et cetera. One of the key things is this narrative that is behind of, uh, of on the regulatory front, you know, getting the contracts right, being very proactive in the roles of multilateral and public development banks and, and, and providing that setting you know, that the investment will flow through these taxonomies, et cetera. And then, all right, like uh, the topic here was also guarantees, financial incentives, but we leave the room here saying that financial incentives are very, very important, but this other part of the story of the framework is, is, is equally uh, as important now to, to have the, the, the fund to flow. So I would ask everybody just to applaud the speakers and as we finish,